B O A one the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily thirty minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, John Russell tells us about discoveries being made by NASA's Webb Space Telescope. Then. Dan Novak and Faith Perlo present this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is John Russell. NASA's Webb Space Telescope is finding bright early galaxies that, until recently, could not be seen. One of these galaxies may have formed only three hundred fifty million years after the Big Bang, the event that explains the beginning of the universe. Researchers said recently that if the results are correct, the newly discovered galaxy could be the most distant one ever identified. The Webb Telescope was launched last December. The recently reported findings. Suggest that stars may have formed sooner during the formation of the universe than scientists believed. Stars might have formed only a few million years after the Big Bang. An international team led by Rohan Naidu of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics detailed the latest findings in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The report gives more information about two unusually bright galaxies. One is thought to have formed three hundred fifty million years after the Big Bang, and the other four hundred fifty million years after. Naidu said more observations are needed by the Webb Telescope before confirming that a new record has been set. Some researchers report having found galaxies that formed even closer to the creation of the universe, which is estimated to be thirteen point eight billion years ago. Those candidates, however, have yet to be confirmed. Scientists said at a NASA news conference. Garth Illingworth of the University of California, Santa Cruz, helped write the recent study. Illingworth described the current situation as a very dynamic time, meaning a time that is active or changing. Illingworth added that there have been lots of announcements of even earlier galaxies, and we're still trying to sort out as a community which ones of those are likely to be real. Tomaso Treu of the University of California, Los Angeles, is a chief scientist. For Webb's early release science program, he said the evidence presented so far is as solid as it gets for the galaxy believed to have formed three hundred fifty million years after the Big Bang. If the findings are confirmed and more early galaxies are out there, Naidu and his team wrote that Webb will prove highly successful in pushing the cosmic frontier all the way to the brink of the Big Bang. Brink means very close to something happening. When and how the first galaxies formed remains one of the most intriguing questions. They said in their paper, NASA's Jane Rigby is a project scientist with Webb. She noted that these galaxies were hiding just under the limits of what Hubble could do. They were right there waiting for us, she told reporters. The ten billion dollar Webb is the largest and most powerful telescope ever sent into space. Full science operations began over the summer, and NASA has since released a series of beautiful images of the universe. I'm John Russell. School boards are usually made up of elected members. 
who make policy decisions about local public school districts. In the United States, some school boards have representatives who are students. There are issues that have made some school board meetings places of disagreement. These issues include measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19, how the issues of race and sexuality are taught, and the place of religion in the classroom. Until recently, most school boards were thought of as nonpartisan, but some school boards have been affected by political disagreements. Some candidates for local, state, and national office in November's elections considered school policy an important campaign issue. Conservative groups like Moms for Liberty and the 1776 Project spent millions of dollars helping elect conservative school board members. Liberal organizations also support candidates and causes. They include Stand for Children, the Campaign for Our Shared Action Fund, and Education Reform Now. Teachers' labor unions like the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association also spend money in support of political candidates and causes. Debates about school policy can involve local and state school officials, school board members, and parents. However, some districts permit student members on school boards. They provide the board with a student opinion on the board's decision-making. The National School Boards Association found that in at least 31 states, local districts can choose to have student board representatives. But just 14% of the country's 495 largest districts have student members. And just one state, Maryland, permits student representatives to have voting power like other school board members. Some student representatives are elected by students in their district. Others must apply for the position. Most are high school students and serve for one-year terms. The OA spoke with five student board members from Maryland, Wisconsin, and Virginia. Each said they felt it was very important for school boards to have a student voice. Zachary Nowacek is a student board member at the Wauwatosa School District outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He said school board members don't always get to see the whole school experience from a student perspective. And because we are the ones receiving the education, it's important for us to be a part of the conversation as well. Janari Davis, who recently finished his term as student representative for Portsmouth City Schools in Virginia, agrees. That was my big thing as a student representative. Students having a voice. As a member, he visited each of the district schools to hear students' concerns. Even before he became a board member, he supported legislation that removed school uniforms for the only school in Portsmouth that required them. In my opinion, an adult can't speak for a student. Students can speak for students, Davis said. Some of the student members say that they have witnessed some of the debates about school policy during their time on a board. Noah Blanken is the student representative in Hartford County Schools in Northern Maryland. The county favored Donald Trump over Joe Biden in the 2020 presidential election by 55 percent to 43 percent. She described the county as the perfect mix of every single demographic you can imagine. Blanken said that many adults 
from outside the district have come to speak to the board during meetings. She said many have spoken out against critical race theory, an idea that makes race a central consideration. During public comments in meetings, groups come and they get pretty loud and rowdy, she said. Blanken said some people who have spoken to the board support reducing funding for programs for poor students, like free school lunches. Blanken said she wanted to be a board member to support low-income students, who make up a large percentage of students in Hartford County. These people are coming in. And they are arguing that we need to focus all of our money on science and math and reading and history to improve test scores and take away all these other resources that these students so desperately need. And it's really upsetting to see. Nowacek said his district in Wauwatosa County recently passed a new teaching plan which introduces students to sexual and gender ideas. On Nowacek's first day on the board, he said a man told the board to go home and look in the mirror and consider whether they believe themselves to be moral people. Blanken said another issue that came before the board this fall concerned the county's mixed-gender locker rooms. A Maryland state senator wrote a letter to the school board opposing the policy. I am appalled that boys can be in girls' bathrooms and locker rooms and vice versa, said a woman during the board's public comments section of a board meeting. However, each of the student members said the board members they serve with cooperate and work well together. We have a lot of different people with different views and opinions, but every single person that sits on the board is there for the well-being of students, Blanken said. Zach McGrath said he believes student members have a moderating effect on the discourse between the board members, because you don't want to get into a fit when it's in front of a student. You want to set a good example. McGrath sits on Anne Arundel County, Maryland's school board. He said he has not seen divisive debates play out during his time on the board. Each student representative also said other board members value their opinion and care about what they have to say. McGrath said that especially as a voting member in Maryland, I am very much treated as if I was an adult in the boardroom. It just so happens to be that I'm representing students. Emmett Jocelyn represents students in the Shorewood School District in Wisconsin. He said having student board members is good for both students and the school board. He said, I feel like a lot of the time, students, they're not aware of what's going on at the district level. And I hope I can connect the students and the school board and sort of make both parties a little bit more familiar with each other. I'm Dan Novak. And I'm Faith Perlow. Now, I'm happy to welcome Dan back to the program. Hi, Dan. Hi, Ashley. If you could choose one important vocabulary word to help explain this story, what would it be? I think the word would be perspective. Having a perspective means having a particular point of view or specific feeling or attitude about something. How is perspective used in the story? Well, the word itself is actually used only once, for my interview with Zachary Nowacek. He said... The school board members don't see schools from a student perspective or point of view. And that's kind of the theme of the whole story. 
students on school boards add an interesting perspective because, as students, they often most immediately feel the impact of any school board decision. They can bring their different perspective to the school board meetings and help guide decision making. Thanks for sharing your perspective, Dan, and thanks for answering my questions. You're welcome. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In 1850, the northern and southern states threatened to split over the issue of slavery. At that time, owning slaves was legal in the southern states. Many northerners opposed slavery, and the question remained. Should slavery be legal in new territories in the western part of the country? The two sides disagreed strongly, but the issue needed to be settled. So Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky offered a compromise. Conservative Southern lawmakers rejected it. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina especially spoke against the compromise, but other lawmakers supported it, including one of the nation's top political leaders, Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts. Said the compromise was the only way to save the Union of States. Four days after Webster's speech, Senator William Seward of New York. Presented his ideas to the Senate and to the nation. Seward was a Northerner. He said he opposed any compromise with the South. He said he did not want slavery in the new Western territories, and he called for a national policy to start peacefully ending slavery everywhere. Seward criticized Daniel Webster for speaking against abolition societies. He said such groups represented a moral movement that could not be stopped. He said the movement would continue until all the slaves in America were free. Seward then criticized John C. Calhoun. He denounced Calhoun's demands for a political balance between the North and South. He said this forced balance would change the United States from a united national democracy to an alliance of independent states. In such a system, he said, the minority would be able to veto actions of the majority. A few weeks after Seward spoke, John C. Calhoun died. One newspaper in Calhoun's home state said, "The senator's death is best for the country and his own honor. The slavery question will now be settled. Calhoun would have blocked a settlement." In fact, many lawmakers had come to support the idea of Senator Henry Clay's compromise, but they could not agree on which parts of it to pass first. Southern supporters were afraid that if a statehood bill for California was passed first, then Northerners would refuse to pass the other parts of the compromise. So Southerners wanted to include. All parts in one bill. A committee of thirteen men was named to write a bill based on Henry Clay's compromise. The committee had six members from slave states and six from free states. 
Senator Clay was named to lead it. Three weeks later, the committee offered its bill. It was much like the compromise Clay had first proposed. It made California a free state. It created territorial governments for New Mexico and Utah. It settled the border dispute between Texas and New Mexico. It ended the slave trade in the nation's capital, the District of Columbia. And it urged approval of a new law dealing with runaway slaves. For about a month, the bill seemed to have the support of President Zachary Taylor. But then the president made it clear that he would do everything he could to defeat it. Taylor did not think the nation was in crisis. He did not believe the dispute over slavery was as serious as others did. He had his own plan to settle one part of the dispute. He would make the new territory of California a free state. There, slavery would be banned. Taylor's plan did not, however, settle other parts of the dispute. It said nothing about laws on escaped slaves. It said nothing about slavery in the District of Columbia. It also said nothing about the border dispute between Texas and New Mexico. Senator Clay, who had offered the compromise, questioned President Taylor's limited proposal. Clay said, Now what is the plan of the president? Here are five problems, five wounds that are bleeding and threatening the life of the republic. What is the president's plan? Is it to heal all these wounds? No such thing. It is to heal one of the five and to leave the other four to bleed more than ever. While the debate continued in Washington, the situation in Texas and New Mexico got worse. Texas claimed a large part of New Mexico, including the capital, Santa Fe. Early in 1850, Texas sent a representative to Santa Fe to take control of the government. The United States military commander in New Mexico advised the people not to recognize the man. The governor of Texas was furious. He decided to send state soldiers to enforce Texas's claims in New Mexico. He said if trouble broke out, the United States government would be to blame. President Taylor rejected Texas's claims. He told his Secretary of War to send an order to the military commander in New Mexico. The commander was to use force to oppose any attempt by Texas to seize the territory. The Secretary of War said he would not send such an order. He believed that if fighting began, Southerners would hurry to the aid of Texas. And that, he thought, might be the start of a Southern struggle against the federal government. In a short time, the North and South would be at war. So the Secretary of War refused to sign the order. President Taylor answered sharply, then I will sign the order myself. Taylor had been a general before becoming president. He said he would take command of the army himself to enforce the law. And he said he was willing to hang anyone who rebelled against the Union. President Taylor began writing a message to Congress on the situation. He never finished it. On July 4, 1850, Taylor attended an outdoor Independence Day ceremony. The event was held on the grounds where a monument to America's first president 
George Washington was being built. The day was very hot, and Taylor stood for a long time in the burning sun. That night, he became sick with pains in his stomach. Doctors were called to the White House, but none of their treatments worked. Five days later, President Zachary Taylor died. His vice president, Millard Fillmore, was sworn in as president. Millard Fillmore was from New York State. His family was poor. His early education came not from school teachers, but from whatever books he could find. Later, Fillmore was able to study law. He became a successful lawyer. He also served in the United States Congress for eight years. The Whig Party chose him as its candidate for vice president in the election of 1848. He served in the office for about a year and a half before the death of President Taylor. Fillmore had disagreed with Taylor over the Congressional Compromise on Slavery and the Western Territories. Unlike Taylor, Fillmore truly believed that the nation was facing a crisis. And he truly believed the Compromise would help save the Union. Now, as president, Fillmore offered his complete support to the Compromise Bill. Its chances of passing looked better than ever. Fillmore asked the old cabinet to resign. He named his own cabinet members. All were strong supporters of the Union. All supported the Compromise. Congress debated the Compromise Bill throughout the summer of 1850. The bill included several proposals. Supporters decided not to vote on the proposals as one piece of legislation. They saw a better chance of success by trying to pass each proposal separately. Their idea worked. By the end of September, both the Senate and House of Representatives had approved all parts of the 1850 Compromise. President Fillmore signed them into law. One part of the Compromise permitted California to enter the Union as a free state. One established territorial governments in New Mexico and Utah. One settled the dispute between Texas and New Mexico. Another ended the slave trade in the District of Columbia. Many happy celebrations took place when Americans heard that President Fillmore had signed the 1850 Compromise. Many people believed the problem of slavery had been solved. They believed the Union had been saved. Others, however, believed the problem only had been postponed. They hoped the delay would give reasonable people of the North and South time to find a permanent answer to the issue of slavery. Time was running out. It was true that the 1850 Compromise had ended a national crisis. But both northern and southern extremists remained bitter. Those opposed to slavery believed the Compromise Law on Runaway Slaves violated the Constitution. The issue of slavery was linked to the issue of secession. Did states have the right to leave the Union? If southern states rejected all compromises on slavery, did they have the right to secede? The signing of the 1850 Compromise cooled the debate for a time. But disagreement on the issues was deep it would continue to build over the next 10 years. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. 